this. Boom. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Armando Duran here with John and Jess with another episode of Monkey Bar Gym, uh, MBG TV. How are you guys doing today? Very good. good. How are you? Nice. How are you doing? Amazing. Thanks for asking. Really excited about today's topic, the most common mistakes every trainer makes. Uh, we have some interesting questions that got submitted here uh, for this topic, which can be really cool to discuss. I know you have several points you want to go over too, John. Uh, before I get started, I'd love to do a couple more, uh, a couple announcements before we do. Um, how, you guys just got done with the base certification course. How was that? It was great. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was really great. Good. And uh, people come from all over. We had people from Seattle, DC, yeah. DC down south. Um, people came from all over the yeah. United States for it. It was very cool. Wow. And um, are these people, really quick, are these people professionals or half professionals, half people who just want to grow their own knowledge? Uh, what kind of people actually attend these type of courses? It's just both. Yeah, it's both pretty evenly, actually. Uh -huh. um, for the base course, I think the majority of them just kind of wanted to learn more information. Yeah. But for like our C&T courses, you'll kind of get a split of people who really want to be, you know, enhance their professional career. Um, and then those who just want to, you know, find out information. Yeah. Awesome. And I, again, I think a lot of people don't know about that. Um, again, the C&T course is coming up just around the corner on April 22nd through the 24th in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, email Jessica for more details. I'll be sending out links. I've been sending out links for more information. So with this uh, replay on the webinar, we'll be sending out links so you get more information about the C&T course and how that goes. If you have any uh, detailed questions after that, you'll see emails, uh, Jessica's email on the information that we send you the PDF. It's jessica at monkeybargen.com. Um, we also got the online fitness uh, program too as well. I wanted to announce that. Uh, we received daily routine workouts, uh, training sessions, plant-based meal plans, ebook too as well, accountability and motivation. So we'll be sending out a link for that too as well. Experience the Monkey Bar Gym virtually. It's all mobile friendly, which I love. Uh, and the third announcement I'd like to uh, announce is the Ice and Yoga. We launched that last week. We're really excited. We got tons of people signing up for it. Again, mobile friendly, tablet, uh, on your phone, on your laptop, smart TV. Uh, this is, uh, this is the, the Ice and Yoga is the foundation of the base certification course, as John mentioned. So this is a great program. It's half off right now currently till the end of the month. Uh, so make sure you guys click on the link to learn more about it. But I guess we'll dive into these, uh, this section here. So the top mistakes most trainer makes. This is going to be an interesting uh, subject. I got tons of questions. If you guys want to kind of take over from there, that'll be pretty awesome. I'm hoping I can get some uh, soap uh, soapbox sessions from you. <laughs> That's a great possibility. Before we get started, we want you guys to see our little new baby here, Holly. Aww. Hi, How big girl. Holly is. Wow. <laughs> Play. She did get big. It's amazing. Yeah. She's a lot bigger. She's taken over our couch. Yeah. And for the people who are not, because there's some people hopping on are not familiar with the backstory of, Ho of Holly. Can yeah. you kind of go over that a little bit? Because I think it's a cool story. Sure. Holly's uh, two months old, I think, right now. Mm -hmm. we, we picked her up after, right after, the day after Jesse's fight two weeks ago. But um, she was only three days old. I think it was three days old. When my sister called called us and um, her mom, Holly's mom, Lucy, uh, was pregnant. And Jill had rescued Lucy out of um, some person was taking horrible care of her and locked her up in a, mm -hmm. had her chained in a room. And um, it, was, it was just a really a sad circumstance. And, and Jill got the Great Dane away from this person and the, uh, ha, uh, Lucy was pregnant. Wow. And uh, Jill called us and said, you guys should come out this weekend and look at uh, Lucy's going to have babies. She, and so she told us they, they had, she had seven, seven babies. Wow. And we went out there on a Sunday, and Holly was only three days old at that time. So she was about the size of a small water bottle. <laughs> and, I mean, about this, about this round. Fit in my hand. Yeah. Oh, the baby water bottle, the baby ones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was, she was about – this long? She's smaller than that. About yeah. as long as my hand and about that round. Sort of like a, you know, just small, like a hamster. Wow, that's amazing. So um, we were out there, and the mom was really agitated because she wasn't socialized around people. She had been locked up a lot. And so our, if we made any sudden movement, like we went like that, the dog jumped up, and then she'd lay back down. Oh. 
while we were there, we were counting all seven babies. And at one point, uh, noticed that where's the seventh baby? And we were looking for it. And my sister Jill looks behind Lucy and sees two legs sticking out, her hind legs sticking out, mm -hmm. and realized that the mom had laid down on one of the puppies. Wow. And we had been talking there for about six to eight minutes. And so she pushed Lucy off, and the puppy was dead. The tongue was black, the lips were all gray, the nose was gray, and totally limp. The body mm -hmm. wasn't. Jill was shaking the body to try and get her to wake up, and she was dead. And so I, I said, give the puppy here. I, I'm going to do CPR on it. Mm -hmm. So I put my mouth over the, the puppy's face. Mm -hmm. and I started doing breaths. And Jesse grabbed around the waist and started doing compressions with her thumb. Oh, man. And um, that brought her back to life. And uh, uh, Holly was dead. And, and since that, Jill said, you keep, can keep this dog if you want her. Oh. And so we, we said, yeah, yeah, we want her. And so we took her and we named her Holly after Holly Holmes, a fighter <laughs> who inspired Jesse to get into boxing. Nice. So, that's a nice a cool, little story. Yeah, that's a cool little backstory. I remember you guys posted it on your guys' Facebook too as well. That's yeah. amazing. Um, awesome, man. Have you ever done CPR on an animal before, John? I'm just curious. Never <laughs> on an animal. I've done it on uh, – I, I, I've – not, I don't think I've ever done CPR on, on anything. I've, I've done the Heimlich maneuver on three people that don't save their lives from choking. Wow. I've never done CPR on uh, anybody, actually, except, the, yeah. except Holly. I tried, I tried CPR on a donkey in Bhutan. <laughs> what? Uh, it had fallen down the side of a mountainside when I was there, and I saw it was horrible. Oh, man. Back and everybody was standing there, and I, I tried. I ran up to it, and I was giving it compressions in it. It was. It died. It was really sad. But oh, no, it's actually the second time I've tried to give CPR to an animal. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Wow, that's amazing. What a great story. Um, so that's a great segue to today's uh, topic. The <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to be, you know, a CPR certified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two weeks later. CPR <laughs> certified. Um, that's right. Before we get started, just want to let people know who's on the webinar live right now. If you guys want to ask any real-time questions, if you scroll down to the Q&A button, click on it, ask the questions. We could uh, have this real-time dialogue with you folks, but we look forward to hearing which, uh, what you guys have to uh, teach us about the, the most common mistakes most trainer makes. Okay. Well, uh, in, the, in the post, we said that we had 10. We actually have 10, plus we got a couple more, just because there's so many that we commonly see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just read off all of the common mis uh, mistakes that I see strength coaches and personal trainers make mm -hmm. and uh, fitness enthusiasts also for you guys out there that are not trainers or strength coaches and um, you, you're like, what can I get out of this? Well, it, the yeah. same things apply to you individuals, whether you're working out at home, working out at a gym, following our online membership and training. Doing these things will give your training upgrade big time, okay? And it's, it's really essential. If you want to get results, you need to do these things. But these are the mistakes. So we're going to read off the common mistakes that most trainers make. Uh, the first one that I see is not making a big goal. Uh, I see the generic goal all the time. Well, I want to get in shape. So we're going to, you know, and that's really generic. So we're going to talk about that. It's, it's very important to create a huge goal, one that gives massive desire. Second one is not body fat testing or physical testing. So not doing testing when you start out. In order to know, uh, one is you got to know where you want to go. So that's your big goal. But you also got to know where you're starting, and that's body fat and physical testing. Because mm -hmm. if you don't know those things, then, then during the trip, basically, to your goal, you don't really know if you're making those changes. And I've seen people come into my office before a body fat test crying because they're the same weight. And then after I tested them, they left the, they left the office overjoyed because they had lost five pounds of fat and replaced it with five pounds of muscle. Wow. That's so, awesome. So that's an example of why it's important to find out where they're at mm -hmm. and, uh, from the start. Third one is uh, not keeping records of their training. This is, most is the problem that most people and trainers don't do. Mm -hmm. 
uh, before uh, the best trainers and the best training that you'll do, you literally write out your workout before you even do it, and that includes your reps and sets. Mm-hmm. You literally write out, well, I'm going to do mm-hmm. sets of seven today, because last week I did sets of six. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's very important that you keep track of your workouts, but also you write them out ahead of time. Okay. So you have a goal every single workout as well. Uh, not doing nutritional planning. A lot of people just train. I know when I was a young trainer in my 20s, I didn't even pay attention to nutrition. And I talk to a lot of trainers today still, and they, they don't really put any emphasis on nutrition. Bodybuilders, MMA fighters, if they're competing, and jiu-jitsu, and other people put an emphasis on it. But most fitness enthusiasts and most fitness trainers don't put any emphasis on it. And they just always say, eat healthy. But there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, here's a big one that at the Monkey Bar Gym, working them out rather instead of training them. This is where I feel, we feel that most people in the fitness world, trainers and, and trainees, they go for the workout to get the pump, to get the sweat, instead of training to improve. And that's a huge difference. One, short-term results quickly become bored with the routine. And the other one is constantly challenged every day. Why? Because you're working on improving form, continually working on improving reps, weight, whatever it have you. Okay? But Mm -hmm. this is all about performance. This is all about instant satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here's a good one. Client. You, you treat your um, people you work with as clients instead of students. Mm-hmm. A client, you uh, are a service provider for them, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's not the role that we want to be playing here as trainers. You want, you want to be an educator to them, and you want to inspire them, but you are not their servant. And that's a big difference. And I feel like a lot of times when people do workouts, they become servants, and they always try and juggle excitement for the people doing the workout mm-hmm. instead of letting the improvements and the uh, performance uh, be the excitement. That's mm-hmm. a huge difference. Got it. Uh, do you want to read these? Sure. Um, <clears throat> walk the walk. There are a lot of trainers out there that um, you know, don't actually practice what they preach, and um, that's, a, that's a huge no-no. If you want to uh, be a successful personal trainer, you need to actually be able to demonstrate everything that you want your client to yeah. do. <laughs> For sure. Exercise, exercise and workouts. Don't have people do stuff that you don't do yourself or don't have ownership yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's, then that leads into the next one. Yeah, where you're constantly – um, shuffling your program around. So let's say you, you start with a good program and maybe the, maybe the um, student gets bored um, or maybe they're not progressing um, and you change it. I've done that myself where I'm like, okay, this person is not doing exactly what I want to do or they seem to be bored. So I switched it. And we're never going to gain anything if we keep changing. It's like that yo-yo thing that we talked about some time ago. Um, you know, workout diet, basically. You're just kind of going on this yeah. yo-yo and changing all the time. Stick with the program and you'll see the results. <laughs> it, it really challenges a person's patience and their dedication as well. And what that, that, that is really important that a person has that follow through. And then it becomes more about the training instead of the workout and the microwave mentality, as you said last yeah. time. The next one, and this kind of falls into this as well, what we just talked about, is trying to be their friend and not their teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, school, you want to establish the relationship. You want to find out as much as you can about this person, what makes them tick, you know, all kinds of things. But there can be a a kind of a shift in who's training who um, if you let it go too far. When I was, when I first started out as a personal trainer, I don't know if you've actually ever experienced this, Johnny, but um, I had, I had clients who were trying to train me. You know, and interesting. That was, it was really interesting. And I was like, wait a minute, this is <laughs> because they were ended up controlling the workout. And if I'm true to my word, which I am, I want them to change. Mm-hmm. They're not going to do that. They're with the workout. They're going to make it as easy as pie for them yeah. to get through. 
and I'm not there to babysit. So I, that was a tough challenge for me, and I had to kind of switch things around. Some clients didn't like it, um, but you know that's just, that's what you need to do. Yeah. So one thing I always tell people is, as a trainer, you have to have a really good connection with your client. You cannot just you don't want to you know you be led by them. So I've had clients, like Jesse said, that I've had clients too where they try and be lead. Why? Because they have their own business, they're multimillionaires, they're super celebrities or whatever, yeah. and they think they, they, they have to lead everything that they're doing. But what, what you got to tell them when that is the case, when they try and do that with you is, look, do you go and tell the dentist what to do when you go to the dentist? <laughs> That's and, nice. Uh, no, and I was like, well, don't try and do that here. <laughs> I, I am the I am the one who you came to for advice. I am the expert here. You are not the expert here. Okay. I want to know what your goals are. I want to know if you're not feeling good during a workout or something, or if you have an ache or pain. Yes. Mm -hmm. but I don't want to be like, well, I want to do this today. I want to do this today. It doesn't roll like that. If you want to get here, we're going to take the path based on your goals and my expertise to get you there. Okay, but they got to be good students, you know, to work with you as well. And if they're not, you got to be willing to say, no, this ain't working. Oh, I see. I like that analogy. That, are you, would you tell a dentist this, you know, it's a good one. I think, I think what happens sometimes is personal trainers get a bad rap. I mean, I think we are looked at, you know, as people who just stop to just babysit somebody on the treadmill yeah. and talk to them. And, you know, there, there's, there's that group. There's mm -hmm. that group. I mean, if that's what you're looking for. But, you know, at the Monkey Bar Gym, we're totally not like that. I mean, we expect you to come in and, and we expect you to get the results and we're going to help you get the results and we expect you to be a good student. Yeah. Um, the next one is not educating yourself, continuously educating yourself as a personal trainer. Um, some people, you know, you can get so far and you just kind of stall out and you're like, okay, I know everything. But there's so much. Johnny and I are still learning to this day. We learn at every single CNT course. We can learn it every single class we teach, um, you know, so there's always something to, to continuously strive for and reach for. And that's going to make you an exciting and definitely more experienced trainer and humble and humble. And, uh, you know, you'll definitely get more clients that way. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the first things. I mean, I've been a trainer 36 years. I can learn from every single person who comes to a course. I can learn from everybody in class every single day. If you have a mindset like that, then you connect more with people as well, you know, and, you know, like you're the best thing since sliced bread, you know, above everybody else, like, and everything you say is gold. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know everything. I say that every single course. Mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. but we do our best. We have a lot of experience in multiple disciplines. And so we think we, we're good at, to help people, you know, generally on everything, but you got to be humble. And what you do, otherwise you, you you cease educating yourself and learning different ways to help yourself and others to improve. And plus it allows you, you know, sometimes when, when you're at that level where you're that humble, if somebody asks you a question that you really don't know, you actually can say, I don't know, and feel comfortable about it, yeah. you know, but I'll find out, you know, but I don't know, but I'll find out. We have a lot of, I've run into a lot of trainers and even done it myself where, they ask me a question and you don't know the answer to it, but I try to fake it. And that's the, that's the worst thing to do. Oh, I heard that. Yeah. One, um, is it kind of feeds into the educating yourself is you're not willing to modify something on the fly or you're, you don't know how to modify something yeah. on the fly. That's so you, you keep pushing them into a direction where they probably shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have, that's why the education, you need to know how to do that. Anything on that for you, Johnny? Uh, that applies. I mean, if you're a really good trainer, you really need to know how to modify a workout for a whole class or for an individual, a person that has an ache in the elbow, knee, anywhere in the body. You got to be able to modify on the fly all the time. Even space. And, and, and space. And, and one of the things I actually thought would actually be a very cool TV show yeah. was you know how they have those iron chefs? Mm -hmm. say, okay, today's meal, you got to make it out of rutabaggers peanut butter and ice cream Ooh. and you gotta go and you gotta make and you gotta make a meal out of it <laughs> I, thought, I thought a really cool show would be for trainers yeah okay now i want a heavy heavy workout so it's got to be a five by five only with body weight and the workout has to be done in a living room go 
Interesting. That would be cool. And, and how do you do it? Or on this piece of um, playground equipment, you got it, you know, or, or with this rock. Or yeah. everybody has a back issue, or people have only yes. one leg, or, you know, all of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, but we've had it. We've had it. Oh, we've wow. Had, we have to modify. I mean, you know. And you got you got to modify like that. Yeah. And if you can't, then then you just you just push away a certain audience. Mm -hmm. you know, the person that is does not have full mobility and, and one of their or two of their limbs or their back or their knee or something like that older overweight with complete lack of confidence you got to give everybody you got to meet them where they're at and give them goals so that they can progress no matter what the workout is i mm -hmm. learned that awesomely when i ruptured my achilles i was like wow there's no way i'm not going to work out yeah had i not had the experience of training people who you know, didn't have limbs, I, I would have never figured it out. Interesting. You know? um, so I was able to figure out, hey, look, I don't need that part. So I can still train. And I trained hard without yeah. my without an Achilles. Wow. Um, getting able, be, being able to know that, I think that it's just a, a, it makes a phenomenal trainer. Yeah. Um, we answered this, we, or we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but not getting rid of clients that don't listen or drain your energy. Um, I had a knack oh, some time ago for attracting clients that were very difficult. Um, very difficult women. And, you know, for quite some time, I just rolled with it. Mm. I would yell and scream and, mm. you know, and I'm just trying to help you out. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you out. Yeah. But, you know, I stayed with it for a while and um, would train these people and it would, it, I never looked forward to it. And there's, that's not a good relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I got strong enough and said, hey, look, you know, to certain people, I can't train you. This is why, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Pass them on to somebody who could do yeah. it, you know, and who could handle that. And, and it worked out fine. And it released, relieved both of us. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, you're a sellout to yourself and you're being untrue to yourself and the people that you work with if you do that. Now, I understand sometimes if you're a young trainer and you don't have much money, yeah, you might have to just suck it up. So yeah. then you got to make the best out of a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And maybe you just keep the conversations to a minimum. I've actually had, uh, I had a client one time that I said, no, I don't want you to talk during the workout. <laughs> Why? Because every single time they tried to stall, that was their stalling method to try and talk. <laughs> so I said, anytime you talk, you're going to have to do X. You know, and I started to analyze them every single time they talked and they stopped real quick. And that <laughs> way we got to focus on the workouts and it took a work, it took a train, a, a client that I had a person I was training. It took them from almost axing them as a client into then making it into a manageable situation. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. That's amazing. Um, the next one, which is probably the most important one, um, it leads into almost everything that we've talked about is neglecting recovery. Um, meaning you're, you're not training balance, you know, you're not doing like what we do base or ice yoga. Um, there are a lot of personal trainers out there that pass on that knowledge to someone else when they can actually get it. Um, so, you know, neglecting recovery is a big one um, that a lot of personal trainers, they just don't um, embrace as much as they should. Uh, what is this one? Not training specific clients' needs. So their um, needs, but their own. Okay. Oh, yeah. So the next one is um, kind of training your client as if they were you. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is definitely a big one. Um, I think, I don't know, working at the Monkey Bar Gym and being, you know, only a personal trainer through that, I don't think I've ever experienced a, a time where I trained someone based off what I could do. Um, cause Johnny does not teach us that, that way. He teaches us to be, you know, really focusing on that client and make sure that you're training them the way that they need to train. But I have seen it many, many times, uh, in our travels and talking to other personal trainers and trainers around the world that, yeah, they train them like they're them, you know, yeah. and, and yeah, there's so many things, you know, everybody listening that, you know, you can realize what go wrong with that. You, you actually see that a lot in the professional world with pro sports teams. They hire strength coaches that were like pro bodybuilders. Interesting. And so that pro bodybuilder comes in and trains the players, high level athletes, like a pro bodybuilder. <laughs> That's a recipe for disaster. And for sure. I've seen that so many times. It's incredible. You can't mm -hmm. even.
and, and I, you see it with everybody or another version of that is the newest fad. They switch and start training people like that newest fad and then they're always jumping ship mm -hmm. to try and keep their customers excited. Mm -hmm. And that's having a couple of things with that. It's, it's lack of, lacking of education, educating themselves on what is best for their client, inability to give what's best to their client because they don't have a broad range of being able to align, work on alignment, nutrition, training that's best for their client, uh, inability to adapt. Uh, they lack confidence to get educated because many people are afraid to expose their weaknesses. Yeah. So they don't like to admit that they don't know how to do rehab. So instead of doing any rehab with their client, they always send them to a chiropractor or somebody else. Mm. Instead of doing any nutrition with their client, they always send them to a nutritionist. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I, that's cool if you got really good ones, uh, people that you can work with like that. I, I just look at it like then, then are you going to farm out legs for, for jump training? And are you going to farm out doing core and, if, if you're a good trainer, you should have the ability to manage the whole thing by yourself with your client and your classes mm -hmm. and have a good program for each. That comes through educating yourself, experiencing all of these different things yourself, mm -hmm. finding what works with, for yourself and then various clients that you've worked with and, and students that you've worked with so that you can have something to, re to relate to with this injured or overweight or older or athletic person that you're working with. And you have some experiences with that instead of just bringing the same old cookie cutter program to the table and hoping it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. One last thing is, is asking for referrals. Um, you know, get more, more clients and you know, you'll, as a personal trainer, I've experienced it multiple times where, yeah, my friend, she's really, she's really overweight and she's kind of scared to come in. Um, okay. That's a, you know, hello, let's, let's bring her in and we'll train her, you know? So yeah. I think Sometimes, you know, you kind of miss those opportunities, but, you know, first as a personal trainer, look for those open doors of getting more clients. Yeah. That's awesome. That's like 14 right there. Yeah, that was good. I like that. So now, whatever you guys want, I mean, we can go more into depth on any of these points. We breezed through some of them. Uh, but I, I do want to say one thing. Generally, the biggest thing that I see missing encapsulates a lot of these. And it's the, the, big, the big thing, if I was to say it, it's our massive action plan. Hmm. If you're a trainer or a trainee, fitness enthusiast, whatever, if you want to really get results, you have to have a massive action plan. And that, has to be, that has to have a serious goal for your training, for your alignment, for your, your body, um, basically your body fat and stuff like that. Uh, you have to have a goal on all three of those. So that's just your nutrition. Okay. That's where the big picture goes. You got to know where you're starting on all three of those as well. Then you got to get a plan of action to take you there, your roadmap, your GPS. Mm -hmm. And you got to continually, and this is another point, you got to keep retesting every single month to see if what am I doing, if what you're doing, is it working? Mm -hmm. Because if it's not working, you got to modify. Mm -hmm. And then you got to manipulate. How is this not working? What could I do? Hmm, let me look at this. And if you didn't keep record, you don't know. So you're guessing. If you mm -hmm. kept record, you can look back at the workouts and say, gosh, they didn't improve on Thursdays and Fridays. They actually went down. Maybe I need to take a day off on Wednesday. Maybe I need to replace that with a base workout. Maybe I need to check in. How are these guys sleeping? What are they eating on th Wednesday night? Mm -hmm. Okay. What are they doing in the morning on those days? Mm -hmm. You have to really look at their lifestyle and, and see from point A, to point B, you know, or C or D or whatever, mm -hmm. Z, uh, you got to see how this entire path is, is working. Are they going in a nice positive direction? Great. Then let's keep doing what we're doing. If it's not, then you need to look at it and be able to modify. Okay. This is all a massive action plan. It is nice. Yeah. I mean, you're really putting stuff together. And if you're a person who really likes to figure things out, this is awesome stuff. If you're a person who really likes to pay attention to detail and likes to organize stuff, this is awesome stuff for you. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you can sit up here and you be like, wait, that didn't work. Okay, here's where we're going to go. Okay, wait, that didn't work. Here's where we're going to Okay, that worked. Okay, we're moving. I mean, it's cool, you know, to be able to put these massive action plans together. It's awesome. And this is one thing that 
we really stress with our online memberships. The Mass Impaction Plan is as simple as know your class schedule, mm -hmm. keep track of your workouts, keep track of your nutrition, or just be conscious of, you know, hand plan, eating till satisfied, things like that, you know, and finding that path that works for you. If you're a trainer, you know, doing these things that I said, find out where you're at, find out your big picture goal, lay out a path of training, nutrition, alignment training, and so that you, it's a live with and you can get them to stay on that path for short and long term so that they attain and achieve that goal. Okay, and you gotta keep yourselves and them motivated the whole time. And be willing to modify if that's necessary. But th things like this, you see it, like for bodybuilders, they're pretty good at things like that. They're very disciplined. And it, but in the fitness world, you don't see it as often as is re, is really needed. You need to test on a regular basis and find out where people are at. And so that's why we stress it so much. Every member at our gym, and they, they, they have to go through a massive action plan and consultation with one of our trainers. Mm -hmm. And so we lay out their whole plan. Mm -hmm. This is stuff that in the CNT course that we, we begin the process of you learning how to do the training, how to do the alignment, how to do the nutrition. CNT one, focuses mostly on the training. The next level of that, if you want to become really high level trainer, then you want to take the CNT Elite course. That one breaks it down. You, you're going to learn a lot about programming, nutrition, realigning the body. If you do that with the base certification that we'll have later in the fall, you're going to have an ability to align the body to highest levels, train the body to highest levels, and then also with the information for nutrition, you're going to have all three points so that you can modify if need be or give people a really solid program to get them to anywhere that they want to go. Mm. So we try and make things as simple and honest as possible for everybody out there because we've done it before. I've been a trainer, like I said, for 36 years. Jesse's been a trainer for 14 years. We have a lot of experience here, and we try to make it as cookie cutter and simplistic as possible for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, um, we apply these as simple as we can online and at the monkey bar gyms. We teach them in basic levels, you know, at the CNT one and then at high levels for the elite course. So whatever level somebody wants to learn at, we hope that it is, we cover it for you guys. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And that CNT course, again, it's about a month away. And, um, and again, it's not just for people who want to excel in the professional realm if they're trainers, but you mentioned it's kind of half and half, Jess, about people who just want to do it for personal development. Yeah. But I think that's so interesting because when I first discovered you guys, I thought you guys did these courses just for fitness professionals. And I was kind of awestruck that there was actually people who got, got in there for their own personal development. Yeah. I mean, when I first started out, it wasn't really – I was more curious. You know, I started training at the Monkey Bar. And um, it's just like everybody who's doing the online right now. You're, you're training. You're working out with this philosophy. And there are start, all of a sudden there are just these little questions that come up. Well, I wonder if I did this, would this be, how would that be? Or, or how would I do this? Or how would I do that? Or, you know, and you just start becoming curious because you're involved in, in education. You're learning about you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I, when I decided to take the CNT course, um, it was more to find out more about me than it was to actually teach. Interesting. Uh, and down the line, you know, I taught. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was more like, okay, how, how do I do this? I don't really know how to do this. So I'm going to figure this out. Um, and Johnny will help me. It was just, it, it's just a natural progression. So for those of you who are online and doing the online and you've had these kinds of questions, I was in the same boat. I was, I was in the exact same place and I decided to go ahead and take the CNT course just to find out more about me and how I can train. And it just led to all great things kinds of things i'm still doing it <laughs> yeah that's amazing that's good and there will be a link out there for the people who's watching this replay or at the end of this uh, webinar i'll be sending out a link for more information if you download a free pdf that we uh supply to you guys it goes in great te uh, detail what just put together and how the cnt works for scene team one and the elite two as well so be on the lookout for that i do have some questions that people submitted about uh, today's subject here um, I have this gentleman here, Kevin, he, uh, he said right here, being over 50, I feel often weak until I get going into a workout with nutrition, whether it be liquids or other means of supplementing, uh, can you suggest any pre-workout, 
uh, combination that will deliver energy from start to finish. Thank you. Wow. Um, Kevin, there's a lot of things that go into a person feeling weak, fatigued. Are your stress levels really high at work? Uh, are you getting enough sleep? Are your stress levels really high at home? Uh, do you, when you do train, do you crush yourselves and work yourself in workouts? All of these can be stressful to the point of exhausting you for the rest of your life, okay? In your week, your day, everything like that. So you have to really pay attention to it. What I would recommend for you is look into how are you sleeping, how is your work affecting your life, and, and you got to think about creating more balance to bring more health and vitality to you aside from the training. Uh, going for a walk. You know, just to get some fresh air is super important. Listening to positive audio books, maybe while you're walking, um, good stuff, really good stuff to help invigorate your body and your mind and your spirit. Yeah. Uh, working out is, look. you can look at it like, you know, as a stimulant and a way to wake yourself up, but you don't want that to be the reason you know, to get yourself going, you got to worry, worry, work out and stuff like that. You want to already have it. So things that, uh, you know, I just try and eat as healthy as I can. You know, I'll eat a lot of nutrient-dense foods. Uh, sometimes I might have a little um, mate before I work out. I like that. It has just a little bit of caffeine, but it's also super high in antioxidants. So sometimes I'll have that uh, right before or during a workout. Uh, Gayaki Teas makes a really great uh, and you can get it at the store so you can have it right with you when you're about to work out. Uh, maca is another natural um, plant that it's, it comes in a powder form or a gel form and uh, you can put that into make a tea out of that and that gives nice sustained energy as well. So both of those things can help you big time. But I think what Johnny, just kind of shooting off what Johnny says, one of the things that you can ask yourself is do you actually look forward to working out? Yeah. Um, and if you're not looking forward to working out, then you might be in that overtraining or I need a break stage. And also, if you are stressed at work or you're not getting enough sleep, your water intake has to be incredibly high. I experienced this myself. Um, you know, I, I have, you know, don't drink enough water. Sometimes I'm dehydrated, you know, and uh, that it makes me very lethargic. So first ask yourself the question, you know, do I look forward to working out? And if the answer is no, let's pull things back. Do base training for a couple of weeks until you feel like, you know what, now I'm looking forward to working out. Um, drink a lot more water and see if that changes things as well. And then, you know, John's suggestions of the tea, perfect. While you're training or before your training is good. I have one other point. Uh, when I first opened the gym, I had, uh, I went through a really horrible time. Uh, seven people close were killed or died. And uh, I had, it was really difficult. And I, and I got complete adrenal exhaustion. And my doctor said, literally, John, you can't work out at all for at least six months. Mm -hmm. This is on the far side of being completely exhausted. So over that time period, I learned a lot about how do I make this work for me? Because I was a workoutaholic, and that was all I knew. And if I didn't work out, I, I was sort of freaking out. And a lot of people out there are in that same mode where if you're not working out, you're freaking out because you're, you're so addicted to the stimulus of working out yeah. and the way it makes you look and feel. Uh, that's why walking, I discovered just going for a walk and listening or reading. I literally walk and read sometimes. Uh, and, and if you do work out, you have to keep it just to strength training, meaning push-ups, chin-ups, squats, deadlifts, things where no speed is a factor. Cardiovascular training, also not a great one. You got you to ramp everything way down. You got to keep everything at about 50% intensity 
okay? And you never, ever go to failure or do any fatigued reps. Mm -hmm. You've got to be extremely mindful of that. Yeah. I had to do this for a long time just to get where my body was okay with it because if I did a set of regular push-ups, I would go into exhaustion. Wow. Yeah, so I had to do like sets of five knee push-ups. Wow. You know, bent over, body rows using my jungle gym for sets of five, which is ridiculously easy for me. Okay, but that's all I could manage without putting myself in debt. So pay attention to it and, and, and give yourself some love. Uh, take it easy for a while and sort of do baby steps like I had that one uh, – Gang, gang leader, do that one time in that story I told you guys about. That was a great story. Well, inch by inch, basically, and he was taking it block by block. Every day he'd add a block to his walking. If you're feeling tired, go to strength training. Drink more water. Sleep a little bit more. Try and do things that de-stress you. Yeah. Listen to positive audio books. And, and love yourself of what you normally do and stay at that until you feel really energetic and really want to work out hard. Then slowly begin to get back into it. Yeah, that's good stuff. What I'm just curious, what audiobooks are you, do you guys listen to mainly for that program? Uh, I listen to Celestine Prophecies, Way of the Peaceful Warrior. I listen to uh, The Warrior Within by Bruce Lee. I listened to uh, Dr. Wayne Dwyer, mm -hmm. and he explains all the um, Tao Te Ching and uh, all 81 points of it. I like that one a lot when I walk. I listen to like a lot of different podcasts, like Tim Ferriss has some great podcasts. I like to listen to his. Mm -hmm. They're very positive and inspirational. Uh, yeah, and the, the Four Agreements is another one we have. I, I have, probably have 50 audiobooks. I And uh, Alan Watts, who actually was a philosopher that Bruce Lee loved to listen to, I have a lot of his stuff. Krishnamurti, yeah. his stuff is great. So all very wise people, all saying really positive things. Tony Robbins, you know, I got all his stuff on audiobooks. Those are all there. They're great people, and they're through all the ages, and they're there, there to support you. And I think we it's so simple nowadays to walk and get inspired. Yeah, it is simple. I Do uh, Do you guys have an audio, what's it called, uh, audible.com account? Is that how you guys download your? Yeah. So it's super simple, right? Uh, you, when you sign up on that stuff, you get a free book for free just for trying for like 30 days. And afterwards, yeah. you can subscribe to it. But um, that's how I consume most of my books. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I got a really cool question coming in right now from Jim Ross. He says, I've been thinking about becoming a trainer. Can you talk about how the CNT compares to the uh, NASM certification, both in terms of what you learn and in terms of getting a job working in the yeah. field? Thanks. Sure. Uh, depends. I, I mean, I used to teach for NASM. I lectured for them all over the world on functional stability training. Uh, wow. That was I was in their very first certification class back in wow. January 1990. Oh wow! Six years ago. Wow. That's the Na so, National uh, Academy of Strength and Medicine, right? Uh, uh, National Academy of Sports Medicine. Sports Medicine. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I know a lot about what they offer. I think now though it's simply online course it so is. Ours is practical you show up and you do it in person and you leave with really amazing practical knowledge and the ability to apply it and it's not a online test where you're just going to fill in the blanks by reading and by rote memorization of a booklet mm -hmm. uh, i think that is sad I think it's it's truly missing the experience. It's knowledge. It's not wisdom. What what I think, why I think our course is so amazing is because you're learning from somebody who's been doing it for 36 years. I have knowledge and I have incredible wisdom on every single application. So, but the main question that I want to ask you is: Do you want to be a personal trainer that works with people on machines? in a personal training world like that, 
or do you want to train functionally? Do you want to learn how to align the body and eat in a functional, truly healthy, whole food manner? Or do you want to follow old school tradition, machines of isolation? That's what NASM will provide for you. And it's good for that if you, that's what you want. It's great for that. Okay? Functional training, that, it's not going to give you that. And, and the big thing is knowledge for sure, knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. That's what you're going to get when you take our course because you're getting the application and you're going to be checked. You are definitely going to be checked on that you know it before you leave because you will not be allowed to pass and leave unless you can lead by example before you leave the course. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to get up in front of everybody and break down the exercises and teach to a class and gain that full experience of what is it like being in front of 20 or 30 or 40 people and teaching this stuff. There is no way you can get that by filling in blanks on a freaking computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a huge disparity between the two courses. But the main thing is, what do you want to gain out of it? Mm -hmm. Isolation, training in that world, that's what it is. Then go for NASM. You want to be more in a functional, real-world application, get practical experience and wisdom and knowledge, come and take our course with us. Love to help you. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. The next question I have from Kelly Moore. Training is fun. Mobility and stretching or not. How do you convince hard charging clients to do the needed perhaps uh, perhaps work so it doesn't uh, become rehab work? Got to challenge people. We got to meet them where they're at one, but we also have to enlighten people where their, their beliefs are. Because uh, what Kelly's bringing to the table is, a lot of people are stuck on static stretching. What I didn't mean to say it like that, but it was really sort of funny. They're stuck on static stretching. That's pretty good pun right there. Pun yeah. intended? No. <laughs> yeah. But static stretching is very archaic, but 99% of the world still follows it. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we, we have to educate, teach them, okay, let, uh, negative attributes of it, it doesn't warm the body. Static stretching does not warm the body up. So it, it, does, it slows the body, actually, in preparation for performance. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do it before you work out. doesn't warm the body. does not prevent injuries. Mm -hmm. Okay? It enhances injuries. And it, it, it can it cause hypermobility yes. in the joint. It can cause hypermobility in the joint, which is the cause of 80 or more percent of injuries. Wow. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's isolative, so it's not whole body in nature. The body resists it. No species on the planet except, uh, uh, except humans does static stretching. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just quickly off the top of my head, seven points that negate static stretching. Okay, yeah. now let's look at the positive attributes of active alignment is what we do, which is ice and yoga and base training, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, it actively warms the body. It prevents injuries. Why? Because it, it creates balance on both sides of the joint by actively engaging one and releasing the other. Okay? Uh, that prevents injury. It, it improves performance. You can do it right before training because it preps the body uh, for performance and training. Uh, what are my other points over here on this side? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, I can't remember all seven points that I was saying were negatives. Yeah. Uh, you can do it in a manner that's very uh, exciting for people. Oh, yeah. All the animals on the planet do active alignment. Mm. We're the only one that really doesn't. Mm. So I always look to nature for the answer. All do active alignment. They do it multiple times during the day. They hold each pose for about seven to ten seconds, and then they move on. That's cool. About, yeah. You know, many times throughout the day, though. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So there's a huge positive side to active alignment. The feel good on static stretching and the feel good on active alignment both can feel good. Which one's easier to do? Probably static stretching is easier because – People have done it for so many years and they think it's the way and you just grab your foot and you, there's no muscle engagement involved. So it's really easy to do static stretching. Yeah. Because something easy doesn't mean it's good for us. 
Yeah. It's easy to go get an ice cream cone and eat it. Doesn't mean it's good for us. Yeah. Okay? So I always look at things like I look to nature and, and then I try and make sense of everything. The question is basically how do you teach somebody whose mindset is all about static stretching and get them to conform to doing active alignment? One is educate, show them the differences between the two. Two, have them try a class out and a base class out or do some ice and yoga with you and see if they don't feel lighter and more supple after they finish doing it. For sure, they're going to feel lighter and more freer with their movements afterwards. Mm -hmm. Which one will you see bigger difference in after a week or two of doing it? No comparison. It's going to be the base in the ice and yoga. Yeah, for sure. I know this stuff because when I was an NBA strength coach, I used to do the static stretching stuff with my athletes I didn't even like doing it with myself and I quickly learned um, fortunately I never liked static stretching uh, for some reason since I was a little kid but I liked doing movement always and when I first started with NASM which is funny that was one of the first studies that I read was mm. there's no benefit from static stretching interesting Active is the way to go. But at that time, I didn't know anything besides, and this is what they didn't know it either. They didn't know the answer. So they would do like swinging your arms as active stretching. That was their only answer for it. But I was like, well, that doesn't make sense either because if my shoulders are really tight, I can't swing my arms that far. <laughs> so how, do you, how do you create that balance? And they didn't even have the answer. Yeah. So it wasn't until seven years later when I – um or four years later when I blew my knee out and I hurt my back, three years after that I met Roger Eichens and he basically gave me the keys to the kingdom and he told me how to rebalance the body to create that health and vitality and lightness throughout your whole body. Yeah. And that's a huge differentiator between them. Yeah, that's amazing. And the ice and yoga, when you first discovered it, what – you said you mentioned there was one that one move that he taught you to do that basically just changed your life. Was that the front warrior? Was that correct on that one? Was front warrior, and then doing that pose every single day, I did it like two times a day for about a minute on each side. Literally, that's all I did. But after one day, I felt lighter. I felt better. Yeah. Uh, and by pulling my arms back overhead, my shoulders would open up more. By doing the motion engaged and not hanging in it, my hips would open up. And that relieved pressure on my knees and my back. And the first day, I felt considerably better. Interesting. Each day after that, I felt a ton better. Two weeks into it, my back pain almost 100% gone. And you're talking about a guy, my back pain was so bad, it took me 10 to 15 minutes to get out of bed every day. Uh, wow. And then two weeks later, I jump out of bed, no problem. And it was just gradual. Every single day, I felt better. But then as the year went by of just doing front warrior, I started to realize, wow, so I'm doing everything in just this frontal plane like this. What if I add rotation? And, that, and then I started thinking, well, that's all the other stuff Roger does. So I'm going to start to learn all the different poses. Interesting. And that's what we got with the Aishin Yoga sequences that we offered for download. But now we also integrate that into the base sequences that we have that we just taught at the base seminar and that we'll be teaching people in the base certification later this year. And weren't you in your 30s when you were having all these back problems? I was actually um, 25 when I first blew my knee out. Ouch. And uh, the back, yeah, it was uh, or 27 about, maybe it was later, because I started jujitsu uh, because I couldn't run. Yeah. yeah. It was in 93, 94, right around that. So that's when I blew my knee out. So that was uh, damn near, that was 23 years ago, probably. Yes, yeah, so I was uh, 30. I can't add but it's 29. Fun. It's funny because, you know, you hear so many athletes who are in their 30s and say, oh, my God, it takes me so long to get out of bed or yeah. put my socks on right. And then here's Johnny at the same time, you yeah. know, still in his 30s doing, you know, the same kind of situation. But in his 40s, start was dunking. Wow. You know, it's like, it's like it can change. It yeah. Can, you know, you're not stuck there and, you know, deteriorating. Yeah. At yeah. That. No. That's a good point. I mean, it was four years. Four years I couldn't run or jump. Wow. And then I met Roger, and within one month I was playing basketball on cement all day again. 
Jeez, that's crazy. Wow, man, that's amazing. What a great story. I have another question coming in from Mark. Uh, could you cover to some degree mistakes by new trainers and what pitfalls to avoid? I think you guys kind of talked about that the first half of have it. Have you listened to any of the uh, <laughs> webinar? He must have just jumped on. It's okay. The next question I got was pretty good. He says uh, from Ben Scott, uh, how best to get trainers to train with their eyes and ears instead of falling back to a one-size-fits-all workout plan? Uh, or put it another way, how do you keep trainers engaged in a fitness school in my fitness schools? You kind of it's it's education is is one, and you're right, having okay, passion. Having but passion. Uh, we really feel like passion comes from training, not working out. And mm -hmm. if you really want to perform, and that's athletic performance. You know, I think the fitness world is stuck on working out. Yeah. And athletes train to perform. If you can get your mindset where you're excited about working out to improve your numbers because you know it positively affects your performance in whatever sports you do or activity, you're going you're gonna to be amped to work out the same, do the same workout that you did maybe last Monday to make sure you improve. Mm -hmm. you know, but people that are on the other end of the spectrum that's where they become disillusioned and they don't want that constant change. And then you always got, you're always trying to keep them attentive. And that's difficult if you have trainers that work under you or as a trainer, if you got clients, you know, or students that you work with, that's a pain in the ass to always be juggling balls for them to keep them excited. It's about getting them excited about improving. That's a huge difference. Yeah. That, and, and that whole culture, like when Jesse and I moved back up here to Madison from Chicago, the culture had sh shifted a little bit more to one about working out. And then it was constantly, you got to give us these new and exciting workouts every single day. And, yeah. and it's been a slow transition to getting people back to focusing on training for performance. Yeah. And, once you get them in that realm, they're really excited about getting strong, running fast, you know, things like, you know, just simple, but it's continuous and it's lifelong. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, we got a couple more minutes here. Um, this has been an awesome webinar and MBG TV session. I, I, you guys talked about a lot of tangible stuff we can implement, not just as trainers, but people who are training themselves too. I mean, they're not in the industry and I love a lot of the points that we could take away from that. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I like to do a couple more announcements before we close up, but is there any, anything in closing you guys want to kind of tie this up into a, a bow? Is there anything you want to say, huh? No, I think, uh, not really, uh, other than, you know, stay curious, stay no, passionate, um, uh, stay enthusiastic, be patient. Yeah. yeah. And then that's for you guys individually. You know, one of the first things that we mentioned in this was big goals. Didn't go into it in detail, but for yourselves and for your people that you work with, students, do not set weak goals. That is so boring, it's nauseating. If you have a client, like we talked about this in previous webinars, is that <clears throat> like for example the woman that uh, the physical therapist woman that I talked to you guys about who I said she said I wanted to run a marathon but I know that's not realistic so I wouldn't mind like walking a 5k or something and I said screw that you're gonna run three marathons within the next year that's a big goal yeah. climbing Mount Kilimanjaro over doing a 5k you know, uh, biking around the lake, which is like 14 miles here. Screw that. Bike 100 miles in one day. Pick something that is completely like, whoa, that's impressive. Yeah. Because it, it, it's you, we only have the one life. Bite off something that's fuck, freaking impressive, you know, and that will really get you excited. Just yeah. boxing at age 42. Yeah. Pretty damn cool. Okay, big goal. Uh, it, it is it to is, get out is. there to That's get in still, the ring. It's, yeah. still, it's still a challenge, you know. But I know with this, it, it, it's making me grow. And you know, and I think you know when I get older, damn, I can look back and say I did that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. You know? 
<laughs> That'll be tight. Yeah, like, yeah, age 40. I did that. But yeah. if you look at it the other way, do you think she's going to brag to anybody when she's 60? Yeah, I did a 5K. <laughs> <laughs> right? And would she be yeah. proud of that? Oh, yeah, I walked a 5K when I was 42. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> if she yeah. said, I hiked Mount Kilimanjaro in one day, I got in the ring and I started boxing at 42. Yeah. Yeah. Do something that this is your life. This is your time. Yeah. You know, if you're a trainer, don't set short term, little itty bitty, nothing goals. Set giant goals. If you train them to something magnificent, they'll never forget you. True. They will love the hell out of you. If yeah. you just set these little nothing goals, they could. That takes no training. They could do that today. Yeah. Okay. They so that is yeah. the biggest thing. Set huge, amazing goals and give them a very clear, concise program to get there. Keep them on track as it goes. Be willing to modify. If you can do those things, you can be an amazing trainer. If you really want to take it to another level, sign up for our CNT and then our elite courses, our base courses, because that's what we're about. We're all about helping you and everybody else to go to higher and higher levels. That's awesome. Thanks so much, John and Jess. That was amazing. So again, I'll be sending out the links for the CNT uh, courses, April 22nd to 24th in Madison, Wisconsin. We also got the online fitness program and the awesome digital ice and yoga program. All those links will be sent out uh, with this email here with this replay. Um, hi, Holly. Oh, she's passed out. She's bored by us. <laughs> she's like, I hear this all day long. I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> That's pretty much all she does. <laughs> That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm night. To keep you guys up at night. Huh? All night. <laughs> oh, I don't want to be my cake. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for you guys' time again, John and Des, and I appreciate all the information. So thank you very much. Thank Hope you. to see you guys soon. Take care. Awesome. Bye-bye.